and thank you for joining me here at Why the Book Wins, where I compare books with their movie adaptations. My name is Laura, and today I'm here to talk about Bullet Train. The book is written by Kotaro Isaka, published in 2010, and then the movie adaptation was directed by David Leach and was released in 2022. Before getting into the differences between book and movie, and which I ultimately liked better, I want to warn you there will be spoilers for both book and movie in this episode. And then also wanted to let you know that this is available as a podcast if you would prefer to listen to it that way. But for those who are watching on YouTube, it is broken up into the chapters down below so you can jump around if you're just wanting to hear about a certain person or a certain aspect of book or movie. But the basic like IMDb premise of this movie and book is that we have these colorful cast of characters who are all assassins or, you know, illegal people of some sort who board the Shinkansen, aka the bullet train in Japan, and all of their various missions that they are on kind of get entwined as they are on this journey. And then we also have this guy who isn't involved, but he boards the Shinkansen because he is wanting to get revenge on this teenage kid that is on the train because this teenage kid has injured his son. And so because they happen to be on the train too, they end up getting involved in the drama that's happening amongst these other assassins, which they're not all assassins, like Ladybug, AKA Nanao, AKA the Brad Pitt character. He's not an assassin, he doesn't kill people, but he is involved you know, in doing these dirty jobs and these illegal activities. But to move on to the book review, I loved this book so much, which you will already know if you have watched my July reading wrap up, or if you follow me on Instagram, or if you follow me on Goodreads, I have spoken very highly of this book and it was just so much fun. And it is a dark action comedy, which is the same as the movie, but it also had a lot of heart to it as well. And just really some really sweet scenes. And there are also just so many events that I had not anticipated. So it was constantly taking me by surprise. But also like, as I was reading, I never I never, like tried to predict what was going to happen because I was just so engrossed in the moment and enjoying it as I was reading it that I didn't even try to predict because I was too busy enjoying it in the moment, you know? And I ended up loving this book so much that I read it twice. So literally the day after I finished it, the next day I picked it up and started reading it all over again. And it was just as good the second time. So this isn't a book that relies on these twists and reveals and that's what makes it good because there's books where I've tried to read a second time, but when I already know the reveal and I know the ending, I just can't get it through. I can't get through the second time because maybe the book wasn't even that good and it really relies on these reveals. Whereas that was not the case with this book. I still really enjoyed it the second time, even though I knew everything that was going to happen. And even though it is just as good when you know what's going to happen, I would recommend going into this book, not knowing the spoilers. And the movie is different enough that even if you've already seen the movie, you could still go and read the book and there's enough changes that you would still be caught by surprise by different events in the book. And moving on to the movie, so as I was sitting in the theater, like at the start of this movie, I was just like bursting with excitement because I loved the book so much and I just could not wait. I was so excited to see it play out on the big screen. I of course was nervous too because I loved the book so much, but yeah, I was just so excited at the start of this movie. And ultimately I liked it. I think there were some cast members that, or some actors that were miscast because this is a movie, like the comedy relies heavily on the chemistry between the characters in order, in order for it to come off as funny and genuine as you want it to. I'll just say right now, I think the guy who plays Lemon, Brian Tyree Henry, I love him, he's a great actor, but I thought he was miscast in this. And then Joey King as the prince was fine, but even her, I feel like, I don't know, she wasn't terrible. Anyway, so I did think some of the chemistry was kind of off between some of the characters. However, I still had a lot of fun with it and I still laughed and the action, the fight scenes were really cool, like a lot of choreographed fight scenes between characters, which I absolutely love fight scenes like that. They do go like the Hollywood ending with like this huge train crash at the end, which was a bit over the top, but it, you know, I'll let that slide. They're also, speaking of over the top scenes, there was also a part where one guy get, gets kicked out of the train and then as it's leaving he like jumps on the outside and it's going pretty fast and he's somehow hanging on and he's like punching into the glass to get back in and that whole part it ruined the suspension of disbelief you know because it just I was like there's no way this guy could do this but regardless I would still recommend seeing this in theaters I think it is one that is worth seeing like on the big screen and getting that theater experience so I still highly recommend it. I will say it was more violent than I thought, so there is quite a bit of gore, 
but it's done in like a funny way where it's like over the top and meant to be funny. But nonetheless, if you're like squeamish with violence, this probably wouldn't be for you because there was quite a bit of violence. And now to get into the details, I will start with the book and just how things are set up in the beginning of the book. So crime boss Minigishi hires Tangerine and Lemon to rescue his son who has been kidnapped. He gives them a briefcase of ransom money, but that's just like to fool the kidnappers because he has no intention of paying the kidnappers. He tells Tangerine and Lemon to rescue my son and bring him back alive, kill all the kidnappers, and bring back the ransom money. So they succeed in doing that and they are on the bullet train with the son and with the ransom money heading to see Minigishi to give him the son and the money. And then we have Nanao, AKA Ladybug, who has been hired to steal the ransom money briefcase. And he succeeds in stealing it. However, he isn't able to get off the train because he is just, each time he tries to get off, something prevents him from getting off. And so after the first time, he decides to hide the briefcase. That way, Tangerine and Lemon, which he doesn't know it belongs to Tangerine and Lemon. But anyway, he hides the briefcase. That way they won't know he has it. And then when he does get off, he can just go and get it from its hiding place. However, it ends up being taken from its hiding place. And so when he no longer has the briefcase and when he finds out that Tangerine and Lemon are also looking for the briefcase and they don't have it either, he decides to connect with them and he tells them like, hey, neither of us have this. There is something else going on. And also, by the way, Minigishi's son was killed very early on in the trip. And so the suitcase is missing, the briefcase and the sun is dead. And so even though Tandri and Lemon and now kind of team up in a way, they are still very wary around each other and on guard because, you know, they work in this shady business. And I'm sorry, my dog is being kind of loud. <laughs> Sorry, I hope he's not too distracting. Anyway, I mentioned that the briefcase was stolen from its hiding place and it was stolen by this kid named The Prince is his nickname. And so he had nothing to do with Tangerine and Lemon or Nanao and nothing to do with Minigishi, but he like saw and overheard all the drama going on with this briefcase. And so he decided to look for it himself and he ended up finding it. And so he just wants to mess with them because he likes messing with people. And so even though he's not interested in the briefcase, he sees people who want it. And so he sees an opportunity to, I don't know, mess with people. And then we also have Kimura who was on board and he got on the train to kill the prince because the prince pushed Kimura's son off of a building and his son is now in a coma. And so he wanted to get revenge and kill the prince. However, it turned out it was a trap and the prince was waiting for him. And so now the prince is holding Kimura hostage basically because he has a guy at the hospital where Wataru, Kimura's son is. And he's like, this guy is gonna call me after every stop. And if I don't answer, he's gonna kill Wataru. So you need to do what I say and you need to keep me alive. Otherwise your son will die. And then also we have another assassin named the Hornet who was on board and the Hornet is the one who killed Minigishi's son, but we don't realize that till later. But the Hornet's goal is to cause drama on the train so that Minigishi will suspect something is going on and he'll show up to the station himself. And then the Hornet can get off the train right there and kill Minigishi. So that is their end goal with this is to kill Minigishi. Moving on to the movie setup. So there is talk of Minigishi, but he is a crime boss who has been killed by the White Death and the White Death is the new crime boss in the area. We find out in the end that the White Death hired all of these assassins. He hired Tangerine and Lemon to get his son. He hired Nanao to steal the briefcase. He hired the Hornet to kill his son and also get the briefcase. And he had vendettas against all of these people because they were involved in the death of his wife. And so he hires them for these various reasons, hoping that they will just end up killing each other on the train, which is almost what ends up happening. And then again, Again, we have the prince and Kimura on the train because again, Kimura is getting revenge on the prince for his son. And then the prince also just sees the drama going on and wants to take part in all of it. So the setup is basically the same, but the reason it's all happening in the movie is because the White Death purposefully hired each of them to cause this drama on the train. But I wanna talk about the prince and Kimura. So for starters, the prince is a boy in the book, whereas in the movie, it's a teenage girl. And the prince was a much bigger character in the book, but in both, he, she pushes Wataru, the son, off of the building. And in the movie, she pushes him off the building to get Kimura's attention and to lure him onto the bullet train because she is actually the White Death daughter and she wants to kill the White Death because she doesn't have a good relationship with her dad. And so she lures Kimura onto the train and she wants Kimura to kill the White Death for her is basically her goal. And so yeah, in the movie, Kimura gets on the train and he had never met the prince before. Whereas in the book, he and the prince had met multiple times and there's this whole backstory between the two of them in the book that we don't get in the movie. And to move on to the prince specifically in the book, I will get to Kimura next, but to start with the prince, 
So in the book, he is a psychopath. And we see how like he fools his teachers and he manipulates all of his classmates. And when he was like 11, he accidentally killed a man, but he felt no remorse for it. And he was just very intrigued by that. And so ever since then, he is just obsessed with death and emotional and mental manipulation and torture and just human nature and finding ways to control people and manipulate them. And he learns how, you know, basically everybody can be manipulated due to the love they have for their family and their children, such as Kimura. He's able to manipulate Kimura due to Kimura's love for his son, Wataru. And so the prince definitely sees this as a human weakness. And he's also a psychopath, so he doesn't have like love for his family. It's also, it almost made it seem like he killed his grandma. It never straight out says that though, but anyway. So even though he's a psychopath though, he has this very innocent, kind, young look. And even Kimura, who knows what the prince is capable of, when the prince puts on that face, Kimura almost falls for it. And he has to remind himself like, no, like this kid is a psycho who hurt my son. But yeah, so he just comes off as this in innocent goody two shoes and is able to fool people. Like I said, like other adults just don't believe him to be capable of the things he is. And in the book, he has no connection to Minigishi. He has no connection to any of these assassins on the train. He is on the train to face Minigishi because he knows about him and he feels like he doesn't have any challenges in life. So he's like, well, I want to face Minigishi because that'll be a big, big challenge. Although even Minigishi has children. And so he's like, I'll still be able to manipulate him probably easily because he has this family he loves. Anyway, so he's on the train to face Minigishi using Kimura to do so. And then when he sees what's going on with the drama, with a suitcase he decides to get involved because like i said he likes to see how to manipulate people and to use things they want in order to get what he wants in return whereas the prince in the movie so like i said we find out that she is the daughter of the white death and the reason she wants to kill him is because she feels like he underestimates her and he gives their son more attention than he does to her. And she wants to show that like she is a contender and someone to be respected basically. And in the movie, she doesn't come off as the psychopath that the prince is in the book, but she does have like this innocent face she pulls where she like cries and is like, oh, help me and people buy it. So there is that similarity. But yeah, we just don't get much backstory on her at all, aside from the fact that at the end it's revealed she is the daughter of the White Death. So yeah, I kind of wish they had done more with that character and kept her closer to the book where, you know, seeing this, I know they couldn't do all the backstory necessarily, but she didn't come off as this like psychopath, you know, maybe, she had other issues, but. And so Kimora in the book, in the movie, like there's a few scenes where we see alcohol around Kimora. But in this book, in the book, this was a big thing because Kimora is an alcoholic. And we learned that he had been involved in illegal activities. I don't know if he was an assassin, but something like that. However, in recent years, he has retired and now he is just a security guard and he hasn't done illegal stuff at all, which is different from the movie because in the movie, Kimura is still actively involved in, you know, this crime underground. But in a flashback in the book, we see that Kimura had run-ins with the prince and his cronies like a few different times. And so he would just butt in on their conversations when he saw them out in public and would overhear them. And the third time he gets involved it's because one of the school kids comes to Kimura's home and because he, he knows who he is based on previous run-ins they've had with each other. And so the school kid is like, hey, you need to help us because the prince is taking mm -hmm. things way too far because mm -hmm. he is like manipulating and like controlling people in his school mm -hmm. and blackmailing them. And it has led to death in his school. And so the school kid is like, you know, the prince is going to torture this kid and his dog. You need to come save them because you're the only one that can help us. And so Kimura goes to the park and he succeeds in like stopping the prince. And the prince is actually threatened by Kimura and actually does feel scared by him for a minute and they all run away. And so in the book, a bigger reason why he pushes Wataru off the building is because he's upset that Kimura like was a real threat. And so he does it as a way to get revenge. But in these flashbacks, like Kimura, Kimura could be so frustrating because he's always drunk and that's why he's butting in in situations he shouldn't be getting involved in. But because he's constantly drinking from his flask, he's just not thinking clearly. And by getting involved in these situations, like he's putting his own son, Wataru, like his safety is at risk. And obviously at the end, Wataru ends up getting pushed off a building. But anyway, so it can be so frustrating as you're reading it being like, man, like just stay out of this. This doesn't involve you. But even though he's frustrating, you are very involved in the character of Kimura throughout the book. And I felt more invested in his character than I did in the movie, because in the movie, we just don't spend as much time with him. And moving on to the movie Kimura, 
yeah, we just don't get much information on him at all, aside from the fact that his son has been pushed off a building and he is now in a coma and he is involved in this illegal underground. Again, I don't know if he's an assassin, but he was involved in dropping off the ransom money to someone else who then, you know, take, took it to Tangerine and Lemon. And yeah, that's basically all the background we get. <laughs> we see him interacting with his dad in the beginning in the hospital, but that was about it. And so moving on to Tangerine and Lemon in the book. So these are the two assassins who were hired to save Minogishi's son. And in the book, they have this constant back and forth, which I found very entertaining and very funny. And when they find little Minigishi, which little Minigishi is how they refer to Minigishi's son. Anyway, when they find him dead, Lemon is like, man, that's so frustrating. He didn't leave us a clue as to who did this. Like, and this leads them to this whole conversation about how, you know, like if one of us is killed before you officially die, leave a clue for the other person so that we can know who it was that killed you. And they also come up with like this code word to tell the person who kills them. And then by having that person know the code word, but not realize it's a code word, the other one who's living can find the killer, if that makes sense. Anyway, it's this whole conversation about the importance of leaving a clue before you die. That way the person who's still living can find your killer. And there is also constant talk about how Lemon in particular talks about how he's immortal. And he's like, even if someone does kill me, I'm coming back. So, you know, like I live forever. And that is definitely something that comes back around later in the book, which we will get to. And then Lemon has the character trait of loving Thomas the Tank Engine. And so he compares everyone he meets to a character from Thomas the Tank. And we find out that when he was a kid, he was raised by two alcoholics who both died when he was very young. And through all the drama of his life, he really clung to the TV show Thomas the Tank as a way to just cope with life. And so that is one reason why he is just so attached to it still. And then Tangerine, like his character trait is that he loves books and he's always reading novels and quoting novels, but it's not quite as big of a thing as Lemon's love for Thomas the Tank. And in the book, Tangerine and Lemon are referred to as the twins, even though they're not even related. And in the movie, they do this too, where they refer to them as the twins and they call them brothers, even though one is white and one is black. So clearly they're not brothers, let alone twins. However, in a flashback, we see that they were raised together. So we don't know the whole story, but basically they grew up together. And they keep the fact that Lemon likes Thomas the Tank. However, Tangerine, you know, he doesn't talk about novels at all in the movie. And yeah, like I said, their banter, it, I didn't enjoy it as much as I had in the book. And there is no talk of like immortality or leaving clues for the other person. And like I said, that's a theme that comes back around in the book that I loved. And so I was sad they left that out. And moving on now to Ladybug in the book. So in the book, his name is Nanao, but his code name is Ladybug, but more often than not, he's referred to as Nanao. And yeah, his big thing, his like main trait in the book is that he has bad luck. And when he was a kid, he was very poor. And so a fellow student told him like, man, if you're gonna get anywhere in life, you need to either become a footballer or a criminal. And so we learned that from a young age, he practiced footballing techniques as well as like different fight moves. And his signature move in the book is breaking people's necks. And then, yeah, he just has constant bad luck. And so he just always comes prepared with like extra supplies just in case. Whenever he goes on a job, he always expects it to go wrong. And so even an easy job, job. He's like, there is no easy job because something always goes wrong when I'm involved. And he ends up getting this briefcase with the ransom money very early on. However, when he tries to get off at the next station, he is stopped because the guy on the other side of the door is the wolf, this fellow assassin. And the wolf is getting on the train because he is getting revenge on someone. And he shows like he and uh, Nanao fight. And during this you know, scuffle. He shows now a photo of who he is after because he is like getting revenge on this person. But now like doesn't really pay attention to the photo because they're in the middle of a fight. And ultimately now ends up breaking the wolf's neck on accident. And then as he is trying to like move the wolf's body into a seat, the prince walks by and now tries to pretend that the wolf is drunk and the prince sees the suitcase with now. And that is why he knows to come back later and find it somewhere in that room. But the wolf in the book. So he gets on the train and he is there to get revenge for the death of Terahara. So Terahara is this former crime boss in the book who has died and Terahara was killed by the Hornet. And this is something we found out later in the book. But anyway, so the Hornet is on the bullet train. And so he gets on the train to kill the Hornet to avenge the death of Terahara, Terahara who was his former boss, who he was very close to and he loved and respected. And so he wants revenge. And then since he sees Ladybug, they get in a fight because, because the wolf had been like beating up on some kids at some point and Ladybug saw 
and he interfered and he beat up the wolf. And so now the wolf wants to kill Ladybug as well. And Ladybug in the movie, he is played by Brad Pitt. Again, as in the book, he is known for having bad luck, but also in the movie, he we find out he has recently come back from like a sabbatical where he did a lot of inner self-reflection and a lot of therapy. And so that's like his whole thing in the movie too, along with the bad luck is that he's trying to be very zen and he's trying to like process things and heal. And it was funny, but I will say that whole aspect got a little old as the movie went on, but it didn't ruin it for me, but it was a bit much at times. And in the movie, again, he tries to get off the train, but then the wolf is there. And in the movie, the wolf is, is getting revenge on the hornet because the hornet killed the wolf's wife and family on his wedding day. And then he wants to kill Ladybug too, because the Ladybug was there at the wedding, being a waiter, like in disguise as a waiter. And it never was clear why Ladybug was there pretending to be a waiter at the wolf's wedding. Like, was he working with the hornet? Because the hornet was there and they poisoned everybody. But I, yeah, I don't know why Ladybug was at the wedding, but he was. And so when the wolf sees him, he tries to kill him as well. But as in the book, the wolf dies on accident. And then to move on to the hornet. So the hornet got their name because they kill people with an injection. And in the book, the injection just makes them go into shock and they die just like that. Whereas in the movie, they make it a bit more dramatic where this injection is made from a snake poison and the snake poison causes you to bleed from the holes in your body, namely your eyes. And if you saw my fire starter video, you know that I'm just not a fan of the bleeding through the eyes thing. Like I get it's shocking. And also for the sake of the story, it helps because you can see like who the hornet killed and it helps kind of keep it in order because they have blood coming from their eyes. So it makes it very easy to see the pattern. But yeah, I don't know. I, it's like one of those things where like maybe it used to be so cool and shocking, but now it just seems overdone. So I personally wasn't a fan of that part. But in the book, it's referenced a few times that the hornet is speculated to be two people. And that does end up being the case in the book. So the hornet is the snack, tro snack trolley girl, as well as the conductor. And so in the movie, Brad Pitt, you know, he goes in the wolf's pocket and sees the picture of the woman. And then she walks in as the snack trolley girl and right away they see each other and then they start fighting. And we see that she hadn't always been the snack trolley girl and previously she had been dressed up as this cartoon character. But then she like knocked out the snack trolley girl, put on her uniform, went in the car where Brad Pitt was and then they get in a fight. Whereas in the book, the Hornet was the snack trolley girl throughout the whole train ride. That is always what her disguise had been. And it was really cool in the book because in the book, Nanao and Tangerine are like teaming up, you know? And so he's on the phone with them and he tells them like, hey, the Hornet killed little Minigishi and you can find out who the Hornet is if you look in the wolf's pocket. And so he's on the phone when they call and tell him like, hey, like the girl in this photo is the snack trolley girl. And right as they tell him that on the phone, the snack trolley girl is in the same car as Nanao. And so Nanao turns to her and he's like, uh, is there a hornet on board? But the snack trolley girl like plays innocent and she's like, you mean the insect? Like, I don't think so. And so then they go their separate ways, but when their backs are turned, Nanao uses his water bottle to see the reflection and he sees her approaching her with a needle. So then he turns around and they get in a fight. And in both book and movie during the fight, Ladybug gets injected However, he then is able to inject her and she reaches for like the anti-venom or whatever. And Nanao is super quick, Ladybug, and he grabs the anti-venom and gives it to himself. And she therefore ends up dying from her own poison. But yeah, the reveal that it was the snack trolley girl all along was so great in the book. And then that scene where Nanao is like interacting with her was just like so tense and exciting. And the fight scene was so cool. The fight scene in the movie was fine, but the snack trolley girl, the Hornet was just, <laughs> kind of annoying in that scene and I so I didn't love it but and then to move on to Lemon and Kimura getting shot in book and movie so in the book the prince is just always hanging around and he and Lemon have like multiple interactions with each other and then near like you know the last quarter of the book he comes across Kimura and the prince and at this point so the prince stole the briefcase he had Kimura hack into it like just trying all the different codes for however long it took until it opened and he got it to open. They saw there was money inside. And then now that the prince knows what's inside it, he just puts it back where it belonged. And so at this point, they haven't found it back where the prince has placed it. And so when Lemon comes across them, he asks them again, like, oh, have you seen that suitcase or whatever? And the prince just plays it off like, ooh, it's like this fun scavenger hunt looking for this briefcase. And as they're talking, 
Kimura tries to like play along with the scavenger hunt theme that the prince was going for. And he says something like, oh, I hope we find it since it's full of cash. And he's just not thinking and it slips out. But of course, as soon as he says it, he realizes his mistake and Lemon does too. And he's like, how do you know it's full of cash? And so Lemon pulls a gun on both of them. And ultimately he ends up shooting Kimura. And then the prince is like, oh, he was holding me hostage. Thank you so much for saving me. But Lemon very quickly is like, uh, something's off with you too, and I don't trust you. However, right as he is about to shoot the prince, he drinks some water that has sleeping powder in it, and so right before the prince is shot, Lemon like basically passes out from the sleeping powder. However, before he passes out, he says the code word to the prince, which we had heard earlier where he and Tangerine had been talking about it. And also before he dies, he puts a sticker of the diesel on the prince. So the diesel is a Thomas the Tank character who is like very evil and conniving. And so he sticks it on the prince to give Tangerine the clue that this kid is evil. Lemon officially just passes out from the sleeping powder. The prince pulls his body into the bathroom where Kimura's body is, and then he shoots Lemon in the head and Lemon is officially dead. Whereas in the movie, so it's the same situation where Lemon comes across the prince and Kimura and in the movie it is the prince who like makes a slip with what they say and so Lemon knows something is up. Again, he kills Kimura, they put him in the bathroom and then he is going to kill a prince but he falls asleep from the sleeping powder. He puts the sticker on the prince's back and then the prince shoots him in the chest and then she moves him to the bathroom. But we later find out that he had a bulletproof vest on and he's not actually dead. And so it ends up being this Romeo and Juliet type thing because Tangerine goes and looks in the bathroom and he sees Lemon's body. And apparently he didn't check the pulse because he just right away believes him to be dead. Like, why didn't you check the pulse? That makes no sense. Anyway, he thought Lemon was dead. And so he mourns Lemon. And then later Tangerine ends up dying. Lemon wakes up and then Lemon mourns Tangerine. So like in the book, I was so shocked <laughs> when Lemon is shot. And also like he and Tangerine are just killed without any kind of fight. Cause both of them, like it, the death sneaks up on them, you know? So he wasn't able to fight it off even. So I was very shocked that he died. And in the movie, like it's, kind of, you know, referring to the fact that in the book, he talked about how he was immortal. And so in the movie, we see that he wasn't actually dead, but the movie never has the talk about him being immortal, right? So I don't know, I didn't like that he ended up being alive after all, personally. I wish he would have just stayed dead the way he did in the book. And so to move on to Kimura Sr., Kimura's dad, so we get flashback to Kimura interacting with his, his dad and we see that his dad is just kind of disappointed with him and partly because Kimura is an alcoholic and, and he's divorced. And so the dad just has a lot of problems with him and feels like he doesn't understand him. But what Kimura Jr. and the reader does not know is that Kimura Sr. and his wife were once an assassin duo, but they retired when Kimura Jr. was born. And so while on the train, Kimura gets a phone call from his dad. And in the book, the prince, he's like, you know what, go ahead and answer because he wants to humiliate Kimura by showing him that his dad has no faith in him, basically. And he's like, tell him the truth. Like, see if you could get your dad to believe you. And so Kimura tells him, like, I'm being held hostage on the Shinkansen. Like, you should, you know, like, help me in some way. And the dad is like, is this a game? Are you drinking? Like, what do you expect me to do? Like, I'm just a stock room manager and your mom has bad knees and what are you doing messing with us like this? And so he doesn't believe him at all and Kimura is just humiliated at the lack of faith his dad has in him. And then the prince takes the phone and he just plays off the innocent boy being like, oh, I'm the school kid sitting next to your son. And Kimura's dad, Kimura Sr. basically tells him like, uh, like just if he's drinking, just try to take the alcohol away from him. And that's how the conversation ends. And then later when Kimura Kimura is shot, they drag his body to the bathroom, and when the prince is alone in there, he tells Kimura, Kimura Jr., he's like, you know what, Wataru is gonna die now. So you're dead, and it didn't help at all because now your son is also going to die. And so he loves someone on the brink of death. The prince loves seeing someone on the brink of death just be put even more into despair as if the fact that they're dying isn't bad enough. He got to see Kimoru's desperation on his face as he heard that Wataru was also going to die. And the prince just finds this fascinating. And so he's like, wow, like this is really fun to manipulate people this way. And so he calls Kimura Sr. again and he tells him like, something about how his son is in danger or something. And also maybe he mentions Wataru, but then he hangs up suddenly in order to like get Kimura Sr. interested and he's like, and I'm gonna mess with them more later on. After this phone call, the second phone call, we go to Kimura Sr. at their home and Kimura Sr. is like, man, like I think Kimura Jr. really is in trouble. 
we should go get on the Shinkansen and see what's going on. And this is when we realized that the two of them, he and his wife had been former assassins and they're just like totally awesome and tough and badass and cool. And the wife, like she's so tough and so cool, but she's also just so cute and funny and their interactions with each other was wonderful. And I absolutely love that part of the book. And I had not expected the dad to be a former assassin. And I just love that so much. Whereas Kimura Sr. in the movie, so he has a phone call again with Kimura where Kimura tells him he's being held hostage, but the dad doesn't believe it. And then the prince tosses the phone. And when Kimura Sr. calls again, Ladybug picks up the phone. And so this is when Kimura Sr. is like, okay, something's going on. I'm going to get on the train. However, there is no wife because in the movie, Kimura Sr.'s wife was killed by the White Death because Kimura Sr. had worked for Minigishi. And then the White Death kind of took over and caused all this chaos. And not only did he kill Minigishi, but he also caused Kimura's wife to die. And I was not happy with this change because I loved that they were a husband and wife assassin duo. And like I said, they're like their back and forth banter and the wife was just like so sweet, but then again, just like so tough. Yeah, so I was sad that like they just didn't even have her. And also in the book, like I said, I was so surprised to see that Kimura was a former assassin, whereas in the movie, Kimura Sr. like has this awesome look like he looks tough and like he's done some cool things. I'm curious like people who hadn't read the book I feel like it wouldn't be that surprising that he was a former assassin because he just has that look whereas in the book I imagined him like just as like a more frail senior citizen type looking man you know. But moving on to the book ending so in the book Tangerine finds Lemon's body and then he sees all the clues that Lemon has left and he sees that the prince was involved. And so he is about to kill the prince when Nanao walks in from behind Tangerine and the prince pulls like the innocent kid look and he's like, help, help, he's gonna kill me. And Nanao falls for just this innocent boy. And so he walks up behind Tangerine and just breaks his neck just like that. And Tangerine doesn't even have a chance to fight. And so after killing Tangerine, the prince like latches onto Nanao. And so the two of them kind of stick together. And then while they're sitting together on the train at the next stop, Kimura Sr. and his wife get on board. And while they're all, the three of them are sitting there together, the prince gets a phone call, but Kimura Sr. has a gun on the prince and he's like, don't answer the phone. Like, if you do, I'll shoot you basically. But we, the reader and the prince, know that this phone call was coming from the guy in the hospital. And if the prince doesn't answer, then that means Wataru is going to die. Meanwhile, Nanao is sitting there and he still buys the prince's innocent act and he doesn't get what's going on with these two older people. And he tries to get a gun from the prince's backpack, but turns out there was a snake in there and it wraps around his arm and he freaks out and he runs out of there. And so at this point, it is just the prince, Kimura Sr. and the wife. The prince tells him like, hey, that phone call was a guy at the hospital and he is going to kill your grandson right now. However, we find out that before they left, Kimura Sr. had called a former coworker and told him to go to the hospital and make sure Wataru is safe. And so while they're on the train, he gets word from this guy hearing that Wataru is safe and that guy is dead. And so the prince is very surprised by this, that his plan did not work out. But he tries to get at them another way by telling them like, well, your son Kimura is in a bathroom and he's dead. But the wife and Kimura Sr. just don't believe it and they're like, no, Kimura's tough and he loves Wataru too much, so he won't be dead. Then from here, when the train pulls into the last station, Minigishi's men like get on board and there's like just all this chaos going on. But before that like happens, Kimura Sr. shoots the prince and he carries his body and is able to get off the train just being lost in the crowd. It is implied that they end up killing the prince, but we don't actually see it take place. And then also when the train pulls into the station, Minigishi is there with all of his men and the Hornet is two people. It is the conductor as well as the trolley, snack trolley girl. And even though she is dead, the conductor is still alive. So he gets off the train and he ends up killing Minigishi. And that is how that part ends. But the, after all this drama on the train, there is like this final chapter that wraps things up where we learned that Kimura was alive after all. So he was close to death, but they get him to a hospital and he survives. And I love it because throughout the book, the prince sees it as a weakness to love other people because the prince can manipulate people and cause them to suffer due to their love for someone else. But then in the end, we find out that Kimura's love for Wataru is what kept him alive. And so I love that it shows the power of love. So I thought that was really sweet. And like I said, we are led to believe in the very end that Kimura and his wife, Kimura Sr. and his wife do kill the prince and that they get rid of the body in an old school way 
AKA chopping it up into tiny pieces. And so the body will never be found. So they will get away with this murder of the prince. And throughout the book, like the prince keeps escaping death. And throughout the book, you also just progressively hate him more and more. And as the book was going on, like I said, he just kept escaping death. And I was like, oh my gosh, this kid is gonna survive. He's gonna live at the end of the book. And that is gonna be so frustrating because I wanted to see him killed. <laughs> So I was so happy that he doesn't live, although we don't actually see it, but it is heavily implied. So I'm gonna hold on to the belief that he is dead, but it, doesn't, it didn't straight out tell us that he died. But I still found that a very satisfying end with Kimura Sr. and the prince and all of that. So I really liked it. Also, we find out that Wataru wakes up from his coma, which was very sweet. And also we find out that Nanao had been hired by the Hornet to steal the suitcase of money. And so the Hornet had hired him to steal it. That way, Lemon and Tangerine would be distracted enough that the Hornet could come in and kill little Minigishi. Because throughout the book, it had been implied that Minigishi had hired Nanao and Tangerine and Lemon. So they were like, what? Like, why would he hire you to bring them the case? But then he hires me to steal the case. And so that was like keeping you on your toes. But then in the end, we find out that it had been the Hornet. And then at the very end, Nanao has this grocery store winning prize ticket thing that he had found on Tangerine's body. So Lemon had had it, he gave it to Tangerine. When Tangerine dies, Nanao gets it off of his body. And so he decides to go to this grocery store and see what the winning prize had been. The winning prize ends up being this basket full of tangerines and lemons. And as he sees it, he instantly thinks of tangerine and lemon and how they talked about being immortal. And even if they die, they're gonna come back. And so this is kind of like a nod to them returning and not being dead after all, perhaps, which again, I just loved that ending. Okay, and now moving on to the movie ending. <laughs> I hope this isn't like a chaotic episode, but there's like, there's so many details and because the book and movie are different, there's just a lot to get into. So I hope it's not too confusing, but anyway, to move on to the movie. So Kimura Sr. gets on the train, but he and the prince don't have this satisfying interaction like they do in the book because he gets on the train and now is there he gets the snake on his arm, runs out. But then eventually the prince like realizes that they've been outdone because once again, Kimura Sr. has a guy there watching Wataru and he kills the guy who wanted to hurt Wataru. And yeah, the prince ends up just like running off down into another car and Kimura Sr. is just like, you know, like whatever, fate will take care of them. In the movie, like I said, Kimura Sr., his wife had been killed by the White Death. And so he's like, you know what? This is all fate. Fate has brought me here on this train to avenge the death of my wife. And they go into the bathroom and they see that Kimura is still alive. And so he's able to like wrap up his wound. And then Lemon wakes up from his sleep. So the group of them plan on what to do once they reach the last station where the White Death is waiting for them. By the way, the White Death is played by Michael Shannon. And he had like a Steven Tyler look from Aerosmith. That's what I was reminded of, but anyway. And as I said, the White Death hired each of these people because he had like vendettas against them for their involvement in his wife's death. However, Ladybug was not supposed to be on the train. It was supposed to be this other guy named Carver, but Carver called out sick. And so the job was pass passed on to Ladybug. But White Death doesn't know what Carver looks like. And so he just assumes that Ladybug is Carver. So Ladybug is the only one who shouldn't be on there and did not need to be involved. But long story short, so the train crashes, the White Death dies, Kimura Sr. dies, but Kimura Jr. lives on and the prince is run over by a truck full of tangerines, which is being driven by Lemon. And the White Death, by the way, he dies by shooting this gun that the prince had made, where when you shoot the gun, it backfires on you and you die. And so that's how the White Death dies. And then yeah, Ladybug lives and his handler, Maria, who he has been talking to throughout this book and movie, she shows up and that's how the movie ends. Which by the way, so Maria, the handler, she's played by Sandra Bullock in the movie and in the book, she was also more of a character and I really enjoyed her and Ladybug's back and forth. Also in the book, we find out like when he gets off at the station, Maria shows up behind him and he's like, oh, what are you doing here? And she's like, I got on the Shinkansen. I've been on this different part of the Shinkansen that isn't connected to the part you were on. So she was on the same train, but she was in a different car that didn't have access to the cars that Ladybug was on. So at the final stop, she also gets off and then they see the drama going on and she's like, oof, let's go, come on. 
So, and they just had a really cute relationship. And Sandra Bullock though, like at the end, she just had a weird look, like her heavy eye makeup and her, this weird hairstyle she had. And anyway, she had a kind of a funky look in my opinion. Before moving on to book first movie, I wanna share some final movie and book tidbits that I didn't really get to. So there's just so much to this book that I didn't even get to and won't be getting to. So it's still worth reading because there's so much to it. But there is a character named Suzuki who plays an important role and he is this like like a teacher who is on board and all of them constantly have different interactions with him. And we learned that his wife had died and his the wife of his death was somehow connected to that former crime boss, Terahara. And thanks to a comment I received on a YouTube video for my July monthly wrap up where I talk about Bullet Train, someone commented saying that Bullet Train is actually the second book in like this unofficial trilogy, I guess. And Suzuki is the main character in the first book. So the first book is called Grasshopper. I have ordered it. The only way to read it is like to get a physical copy. So I bought a physical copy, but it won't arrive until the end of September. But anyway, so I'm so excited because in the book, I was like, man, Suzuki is clearly an important role in this. And I was trying to figure out his place in the story. But the fact that this is like a sequel and Suzuki is the main character in the first book makes total sense. So I'm so excited to read that first book and hear more about Suzuki and Terahara and all of that stuff. And then I mentioned the snake getting on Ladybug's arm in both book and movie. And in both, we found out that the snake had been stolen from a zoo. And in the book, it's just kind of random and we don't know why. It's just a snake on the train that gets loose. Whereas in the movie, movie we find out that the hornet had stolen the snake because that snake venom is what she uses in her venom, in her poison dart shots things. And then in the movie, Channing Tatum has a cameo as this guy, Brad Pitt pays him to wear a disguise to distract Tangerine. And this does happen in the book too, where Nano, Nano pays people to distract Tangerine. But in the book, it's like this guy in this drag queen, whereas in the movie, it's Channing Tatum. So that was kind of a funny cameo. Speaking of cameos, remember I talked about Carver because he is the guy that called out sick, and so Brad Pitt showed up instead. We get a scene with Carver, and we see that it is Ryan Reynolds. He has no dialogue though, it's just like a three second shot of him as Carver. So again, that was kind of a fun cameo. And then Logan Lerman who plays a son of the White Death. He dies very early on, but it was still cool seeing him in this movie. Back in the day, I had crushes on Logan Lerman and Aaron Taylor Johnson, who plays Tangerine. So it was fun to see both of them in this movie. Speaking of Tangerine, in the movie, Lemon and Tangerine have British accents and they were pretty thick British accents. And like at the start of the movie, I was wishing there were subtitles on, not to sound like an annoying American, but I had a hard time understanding them. However, as the movie progressed, I did get more used to their voices and I was able to understand them better. And then in the movie, I talked about the gun the prince makes that shoots, like backfires on the person who shoots it. And that's how the white death dies. In the book, Lemon, Tangerine actually, gets this gun when they rescue little Minigishi. So a, one of the kidnappers had had this gun, Tangerine took it, but he looked at it before using it and he saw how it was rigged. And so throughout the book, different people have this gun and you keep waiting for someone to shoot it and it'll backfire on them, right? Cause it's referenced so much. So it's clearly like Chekhov's gun, right? It's gonna play an important role, which it does in the movie. But in the book, it is never fired. <laughs> Nobody ever uses it. But I actually love that because it's like the anti Chekhov's gun, right? Because we keep waiting for it to be used, but then it never is used. So I really like that. Speaking of the backfiring gun in the movie, the prince, when she opens the case, when Kimura opens the case, she rigs it with an explosive so that whoever opens it, it will explode. And so when they reach the final destination with the White Death, the White Death's men open the case and cause this huge explosion. Whereas in the book, the prince doesn't do anything with the case. Like he steals some of the credit cards that are in there. But aside from that, he does nothing with the case and there isn't any explosion with it. And then one final thought, this book is written by a Japanese author. It takes place in Japan in both book and movie. And in the book, everybody is Japanese, all of the characters. Whereas in the movie, the only Japanese people are Kimura and Kimura Senior, which was kind of annoying. Like really, like you couldn't have gotten at least some of the other main characters. You couldn't have had them be Japanese or, you know, there's plenty of Asian actors in Hollywood you could have cast in some of these roles, right? But instead you chose non-Asian people. And then one final section, I want to talk about the themes in the book because there are a lot of different themes here. For starters, we have like old versus young slash, you know, like respecting your elders slash old school versus new school. The way this whole thing ends is the old school wins because Kimura Sr. is underestimated by the prince because the prince is like, oh, I'm so much better and I'm so unique and I'm so much smarter than all you people. 
However, he ends up being outsmarted by Kimura Sr. And there is a lot of talk about how tough Kimura Sr. is and how you have to be tough and you have to be smart in order to make it to you know your late 60s, which is how old Kimura Sr. is. And so I did enjoy that aspect of the story. The prince just thinks he's so unique, like I said. And so there's that too, where all these other older people are like, you're not that unique. Like I had some of these same thoughts as you when I was a kid. And so like I've noticed that the older I get, like younger generations have these ideas and have these thoughts and they think they're so different. And it's like, no, like I think everybody <laughs> has that going on in their mind when they're young. And we all think we're so unique for thinking these things, but we're not. They're thoughts everybody has had. But there's also a lot of talk, talk of like mob mentality, whether a person will do what is what they know is right or if they're just going to do and say what everybody else around them is doing. And then talk of uh, like morality, specifically why is it bad to kill people? This is a question the prince is often asking and different characters give different answers to this, but the most like in-depth answer is given by Suzuki, that character I mentioned. And so that was another theme going on in the book. And then we also have Nanao, whose codename is Ladybug. And in the book, it's mentioned how ladybugs, they're not actually lucky, but instead they like take on the burdens of those around them. And Nanao is said to be a very empathetic person. And so maybe his bad luck comes from just being so empathetic and understanding and taking on these burdens of those around him. But to wrap this up, book versus movie, you won't be surprised to hear me say that the book wins. It was so fantastic. I loved it so much. You should still go read it even after knowing all the spoilers. And in the movie, I just wish they had stayed more true to the book, especially with Kimura, both Kimura Jr., Kimura Sr., and his wife. Like they were such a big part of the book and you just didn't feel that connection to them in the movie that was there in the book. And then Kimura Sr.'s wife was such an awesome character and she isn't even there at all. And I just didn't feel invested in Kimura Sr.'s revenge in the movie, I just, I, I don't know. I wasn't super invested. The movie, like it has an older, like Guy Ritchie's older films. It kind of has that vibe along with like a Quentin Tarantino vibe, but I don't think it's as good as Quentin Tarantino movies. And I don't think it's as good as some of Guy Ritchie's older movies. Maybe it's on par with some of his older movies, but anyway, so it kind of has that Guy Ritchie, Quentin Tarantino vibe. So if you enjoyed those movies, I think you will still enjoy this one. Like I said, I don't think it's as well done as it could have been. And ultimately I would give it three or three and a half stars. I'm curious what I would have thought of this had I not read the book, but it's hard to say, I don't know. Basically go see it in theaters. It is a very fun time. It is one that is worth seeing on the big screen. And it's important to support movies that aren't a superhero comic book movie, right? Like <laughs> stop giving all the money to Thor and Doctor Strange and Spider-Man, whatever. Go support these other movies that are actually unique stories. I say unique stories. Yes, it's an adaptation, but nonetheless, anyway, go see this in theaters. I really enjoyed it. Yes, it has its flaws, but ultimately I think it is worth the money. And that wraps it up for my book first movie. Also go read this book. It was so good. The audiobook is really good as well. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Again, I hope it wasn't too all over the place. I tried to structure it in a somewhat linear fashion, but yeah, anyway, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to, to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel. If you're listening to this as a podcast, Podcast, I would love a rating and review on Spotify and on Apple Podcasts. It would mean so much to me. And join me next week because next week I am celebrating my two year anniversary of these book first movie episodes. So for my two year anniversary, I will be looking, looking back on the past year. In the last year, I have done 53 book first movie episodes, which is an insane amount. <laughs> like there's a lot of work that gets put into these episodes, right? I read the book. So the time right there that it takes, plus I watch the movie and just a lot of time goes into these episodes. So it's insane that I've done 53 in the last year. But anyway, so next week I will be talking about best and the worst from the past year. Anyway, thank you again. Uh, let me know down in the comments below what you thought of this movie. Let me know if you have read the book and yeah, I will see you next time. Bye.